Hello and welcome to the Mile End Institute. My name is Tim Bale and I'm the co-director. Because we've had to postpone our events for the foreseeable future, we thought we'd like to provide uh, some debate on the hot topics of the day through other means. And one of the ways we can do this is through our YouTube channel. So uh, the first video that we have coming up is by my colleague and friend, uh, Professor Sophie Harmon from the School of Politics and International Relations here at Queen Mary University of London. And Sophie's going to be discussing whether we should have seen this crisis coming. Hope you find it interesting and I hope you'll stick around for more videos as they come. Hello, I'm Sophie Harmon. I'm a professor of international politics at Queen Mary University of London, where I specialise and conduct research into global health politics. As millions of people around the world adjust to this really weird new normal life under self-isolation and social distancing, I think lots of us are kind of asking the question, how did we not see this coming? Now, the simple answer to that is I'm afraid we did. And I'm not talking about some dystopian novel predicting some plague emanating out of certain parts of the world. I'm actually talking about a particular area of study called global health security that sees health and pandemics as a threat to the security and well-being of individuals, states and society, and therefore see responding to health threats as a key part of international peace and security. Now, this field of global health security has been planning and thinking about the big one, the big outbreak, for a really long time. And here it's always been a question of when, not if, this happens. Some of you might be thinking, well, this is all very well, but how does that mean that we can actually prevent these things from happening? Because we've been thinking about when, not if, there is a whole architecture of pandemic preparedness. This architecture has really grown since the early 2000s in response to what was seen as the threat of HIV and AIDS around the world, H5N1, H1N1, all those kind of flus, and also Ebola and Zika. As a consequence of this, the World Health Organization in 2005 really invigorated its pandemic preparedness framework, at the heart of which is the international health regulations. Now, without boring you with too much detail, the real purpose of these is to make states coordinate in trying to detect and report outbreaks when they happen and provide infrastructure to other states that might have an undeveloped, weak surveillance capacity. So what we mean is ability to detect these outbreaks when they happen. It's meant to emphasise collaboration in the international community, to have this global idea of health security for all. Now, there's a lot of kind of different aspects to this. There is the Global Outbreak Alert Response Network. The World Bank has a Global Health Emergencies Funding Facility. Now, attached to the international health regulations, you have lots of different architectures at the global level. So probably the Global Outlook Alert Response Network, it's a bit of a mouthful, and at national level, where you see nation states preparing internally their surveillance capacities. We've also seen a growth of funding capacity as well, with emergency financing facilities being put in institutions like the World Bank. So should this happen, they can release funds. But here's the rub, particularly to lower and middle income countries. So altogether, we have this architecture that is supposed to detect these outbreaks and respond to them as quickly and as effectively as possible. As I'm sure you know already, speed is everything can't listen to the news or watch the news without people talking about speed. So if we knew that this could be coming, why have we got ourselves into this position? What is the rub here? Now these are the big problems. This is how we've got into this position. Firstly, there is a lack of domestic investment or state investment globally in pandemic preparedness. Many countries around the world really struggle to deliver and pay for those health issues that you can see in everyday life. I'm a British citizen. Every other day there is in the news, there's something about the NHS being underfunded and under threat. So to then say, well, now we need additional funds to fund something we don't even know or see yet is a hard sell. And it's a particularly hard sell in the British public. 
just for an example. But the Brits aren't alone. This is the same around the world. Trying to get people to prepare for something and fund something is really tricky, particularly when you haven't ever been subject to an outbreak like this before. The other issue is you have world leaders who disinvest from pandemic preparedness. The number one example, you guessed it, President Donald Trump, who when he came to office, reduced funding significantly for the Centers for Disease Control and the National Institute of Health, two key actors in providing global health security in the US and around the world with the work that they do. So these are the problems, lack of investment, leadership, the other issue is the whole system depends on states collaborating, sharing information and reporting cases when they see them. So this is timely. So you have to report, share the information you have and work together. And increasingly, when you see states becoming more isolated or withdrawing from international institutions and collaboration, this is a really big problem because you cannot solve a pandemic individually within states. You'll see that with surveillance reporting and you'll see that if we get a vaccine as well. Finally, though, the other problem is what we call a biosecurity dilemma. How do you know it's the big one? So swine flu we thought was going to be the big one. This turned out to be, okay, not great, did have an impact on many people's lives, but actually it wasn't as big as we thought it was going to be. So how much do you raise the expectations, get the public to act accordingly when you don't know the size and scale of the epidemic? Combined then, this makes actually seeing these outbreaks coming quite hard. We have the mechanisms, we just lack the political will and investment into them, which combined is why we see ourselves in the position we are today. The good news is, because of this framework around global health security, we technically do know what to do. There are protocols. We have learned a lot from different outbreaks. So hopefully we can then take that knowledge and investment to provide greater global health security going forward.